So today we're going to learn about trade barriers and try to establish just how effective trade barriers actually are. So as we all know, voluntary trade is a good thing. But sometimes, sometimes the government might want to restrict or limit trade. Policies that do this are called trade barriers, and the most common types are tariffs, quotas, and embargoes. So let's start with tariffs. A tariff is defined as a tax on imports. This is a tax that is imposed by the government on any products or certain products coming into the country from overseas. And this is a tax that is paid by an importer or consumer in your country. An example of this is a tax that the United States places on steel. The U.S. adds a 30% tax on all steel coming into the country. This helps to protect U.S. steel companies from foreign competition. The way tariffs work is they make imported goods more expensive. And by making the imported goods more expensive, this encourages people to buy goods made in their own country. So the purpose of a tariff is to protect domestic industries from foreign competition. So we should take a moment to address a couple of common misconceptions about tariffs. First of all, the main purpose of a tariff is not to raise money for the government. That's something I hear from students all the time. Now, this was true a long time ago, back when tariffs were the main source of tax revenue for the federal government. Now, however, there are other sources of tax revenue and tariffs are used primarily to give a competitive advantage to certain domestic industries and domestic companies. The other big misconception is that foreign countries do not pay for tariffs. Tariffs are not paid for by foreign uh, countries. U.S. tariff fees are paid for by U.S. importers and ultimately American consumers. So Americans pay for American tariffs. If you ever hear someone uh, talk about how China has been punished by making chi the Chinese pay billions of dollars in American tariffs, that's simply not true. Any tariffs on Chinese goods are paid for by Americans. Let's take a look at a historical example of a tariff in action. If you've ever gone shopping for tires, you know that tires can get pretty expensive. And the baseline, basic cheap tires that you can get in the United States run about $100 per tire. So if you wanna buy a set of tires for your car, that's gonna cost you about $400. In the early 2000s, a, a change happened in the marketplace. You see companies in China started selling tires to distributors in the US. And these Chinese tires, which are of comparable quality to American tires, well, those started, instead of starting at $100 a piece, those started at around $80 a piece. So now an American consumer could buy tires, instead of paying $400 for a set, you could get them for $320. So obviously, a lot of consumers started to turn to Chinese tires. Now, this meant that people were turning away from American tires, and this uh, obviously upset some American tire companies. Namely, Goodyear, Bridgestone, and Michelin. They were losing money now that people were turning to their Chinese competitors, and they wanted the government to do something about it. So in September of 2009, President Obama signed a 35% tariff into law. This was a 35% tariff on all tires coming in from China. So let's talk about how this works out now. So if you put a 30% tariff on these $80 tires, well, now they're no longer $80. This raises the price of these Chinese tires. So instead of $80 a piece, they're now going to be $108 each. This means that a set of four tires, instead of being 320 bucks, now they are $432 for the same tires. That makes the American tires a much better deal at $400. This means that consumers will start to turn to the American tires instead of the Chinese tires. Who benefits from this tire tariff. And in fact, for all the trade barriers we discussed today, 
uh, there are winners and there are losers. So who are the winners? Well, a lot of people will start off by saying, oh, well, the, the winners are the United States. Well, it's a bit more complicated than that. The winners on Obama's tire tariff, well, obviously, some American tire companies. So the American tire companies are, are definitely winners because now they have more business. The people who had been turning to Chinese tires are now buying tires from the American companies again. And of course, American tire workers are also beneficiaries of this tax. And it was estimated by economists that somewhere around 1,200 jobs were saved in American tire factories. So the American tire companies and American tire workers, they definitely benefit from this tariff. Ah, but there's also losers as well. Let's see who was on the losing end of this tariff. Well, obviously the Chinese tire companies, they are certainly losers on this deal because they are no longer able to sell as many tires in the United States. So those tire companies are losing money along with their, the workers of these Chinese tire companies. But who else is losing on this deal? Oh, oh, there's other people too. You see the people working for American tire retailers, these are the stores that sell tires, they're losing money on this deal because tires are now more expensive because you cannot get the cheaper Chinese tires anymore. People are being more careful about how often they buy tires. So that means less business for the American tire stores, the retailers, and that also means that some retail tire workers end up getting laid off. Other losers on this deal though include American consumers because now American consumers have to pay a lot more money for these tires. They're expecting to be able to save some money and that money would be spent on other things, but now they have less money to spend on other things because well, they have to spend more to buy a set of tires. Additionally, the US economy overall is hurt by this deal. Consumers who were expecting to have more money uh, left over from buying tires. Well, now they have less money to spend, and that means less money gets spent on other things in the economy. Economists, in fact, uh, estimated that around 3,731 retail jobs were lost as a result of this tire tax. Uh, you compare that to the 1,200 jobs that were saved, well, more jobs were lost than were saved by this tariff. Ah, there's one more group that was hurt by this tariff chicken farmers. There are a lot of people in China and a lot of people in China like American chicken. So they are the largest customer, the largest customer for, customer for American chicken farmers. Well, you see, the Chinese, once they found out that we were imposing this uh, huge tariff on their tires, well, they didn't exactly decide to take that line down. They decided to retaliate. And so they hit an American uh, business with tariffs of their own. And in this case, they put huge tariffs on American chicken. So this means that uh, because of this, American farmers lost more than a billion dollars in sales and thousands of jobs because now U.S. chicken became too expensive for people in China to buy because of the Chinese tariffs. So did the Chinese uh, tire tariffs actually help the U.S. economy? It did obviously uh, benefit the people who work for these tire companies and it may in fact have uh, helped save some of these tire companies and kept them out of bankruptcy. But for the overall economy, it looks like it probably did more harm than good. Our next trade barrier is a trade barrier called a quota. Now, quota is defined as a limit on the number of specific products that can come into a country. It works in a similar way. It has a similar effect to a tariff, but this time they are you are limiting uh, the number of products rather than putting a tax on them. And probably the most famous example is in the 1980s, the Japanese were limited to only exporting a certain number of cars to the United States. And why this matters? Well, it works. Quotas work in a similar way to tariffs. They are there to encourage the people of a country to buy products made in their country and not foreign goods. So again, a quota's purpose is to protect domestic industries, those are industries in your country, from foreign competition. So we mentioned this uh, 
this quota on Japanese cars. Well, let's, uh, let's learn a little bit more about the history of this. You see, for uh, many, many years, for many, many years, the three biggest, most impressive car companies in the world were all based here in the United States. Ford, Chrysler, and GM, in fact, were referred to as the big three. They were the kings of the auto industry, producing the most and, frankly, best cars for a long time. By the 1970s, American cars from Ford, GM, and Chrysler started to get bigger and bigger. They used more gas, they took up more space, and unfortunately became uh, pretty unreliable. They broke down a lot. During the 80s, the Japanese car companies, on the other hand, Toyota, Honda, and Datsun, well, they started producing cars that were smaller, they used less gas, and they were much more reliable. Oh, and by the way, also less expensive. So obviously American consumers growing tired of uh, driving large inefficient American cars, a lot of them started turning to Japanese cars. Uh, obviously this meant that there was less business for the American car companies. Understandably, the big three not happy about this. And so what they did is they turned to Washington. They asked their government to help them compete with the Japanese car companies. So in April of 1981, President Reagan arranged for strict import quotas on all Japanese cars, limiting the total number of Japanese cars that can come into the country. After a certain number, no more can come in. So let's talk about who benefited from President Reagan's quota on Japanese cars. Well, obviously, um, our first set of winners are the American car companies, Ford, GM, and Chrysler. Now suddenly uh, people have a reason to buy cars from them again. And so uh, they are winners on this deal, along with the workers for these companies. Let's talk about the losers though. Yes, obviously the Japanese uh, auto companies, uh, they're, they're losers on this deal because all of a sudden they're not able to sell as many cars as they want in the US. So they're gonna be losing a lot of money. But also American consumers, American consumers are losers on this deal too. Uh, it was estimated by the way that American cons consumers had to pay an extra $5 billion on lower quality American cars in 1984 alone. The American economy, was hurt as well because your consumers were um, having to spend extra money on lesser quality cars. That's less money that they got to spend in other parts of the economy. So did these quotas help our economy? No, no, they definitely did not. Arguably they saved a couple of companies and uh, there's, there's certainly uh, something to be said for that, but for the overall economy, no. Now, the last two trade barriers that we talked about, uh, tariffs and quotas, are put in place for economic reasons. This particular trade barrier, an embargo, this has a different purpose. This one is put in place for political reasons. And the definition of an embargo is cutting off trade to a certain country, well, because of political reasons. One example of this, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in 1990, the United States and well, then the UN for that matter, uh, put an embargo on all Iraqi products. The reason why this matters, you see, embargoes are put in place to hurt the exporting country because we don't buy their products. Uh, we hurt them in order to make a political statement and hopefully get them to change something that they are doing. So the purpose of an embargo is to force the target country to change something. The country is doing something that you disapprove of and you are trying to politically and economically force them into doing something different. Now, the most famous embargo from an American perspective would be the embargo that uh, was imposed after the communists took over Cuba in 1959. So in 1959, no, this is during the peak of the Cold War, Fidel Castro and his communists uh, seize control of the nation of Cuba. So in October of 1960, President Eisenhower begins an embargo against Cuba to try to convince the Cuban people to overthrow Fidel Castro and the communists. 
Now, the winners for this, well, let's let's be honest. I can't really think of anyone who won economically from this embargo. Arguably, it does make the political statement. Now, there's a long list of losers, though. The Cuban people, for one thing. Uh, their their major trading partner in the world, well, was the United States. And so uh, this, this leads to shortages of food and shortages of medicine there. Uh, the Cuban economy is a loser here. Uh, estimated that they were losing somewhere around $750 million in business every year because of this embargo. But let's let's make no mistakes here. The U.S. economy is also a loser on this. Um, the U.S. loses somewhere around $1.2 billion in business annually that they could be uh, doing with Cuba. And likewise, U.S. workers, thousands of U.S. jobs uh, could be happening if we did not have this embargo. All right, well, let's talk about the effectiveness. Did the Cuban embargo work? Well, the Castros are still in charge there. The communists are still in charge in Cuba. So no, this embargo that's been in place for what now, more than 50 years has not worked. It has definitely not worked. And so it has not had the effect that we want it to have. So what are trade barriers good for then? Well, they don't actually help the economy. Anytime you are reducing the amount of trade, you are not helping the economy. The more you trade, the more wealthy your economy gets. The less you trade, the poorer your economy gets. So they're not actually helping the economy. Protective trade barriers like uh, tariffs and quotas, they do help some workers and certain companies, but at the expense of others. Now, uh, there might be a times when that will be worth it. You know, sometimes it is uh, beneficial to a country to protect particular industries, but uh, that always comes at a cost. And embargoes hurt everyone involved, and they rarely cause any kind of a change.